Welcome to the Unimaginary Friendcast. This is episode 316. It's a conversation with your best friends where we give you all of the super awesome, neat stuff of the world. We are your hosts. I'm Nathan Von Edmondson. I'm Erin Marie Betty Davis Jr. And I'm DavidMonster.com. Oh, David's all dressed up today. If you're just listening, you are missing out on maybe the most interesting outfit that David's ever worn. The shirt says, that's Miss Bitch to you. And he has a crown that says, cunt. David, did you make that crown for yourself? I did. I made it a long time ago. Look, I made it. It's very David Monster-y. It matches Thank your shirt. Thank you. <laughs> like the, the, they match the pinks and the blacks. Um, hello. Uh, so does my underwear. So does my socks. What kind of a psychopath doesn't... <laughs> Uh -oh. I'm wearing a very important shirt today as well. You're gonna have to get close to the camera to show everyone what that is. Yeah, we need to see it. Ooh. Uh oh, is it is that is that, is that your IAS IAS membership? What is it? I can't read it. Scientology lifetime membership shirt. Yeah, <laughs> IAS IAS membership. Thank God we finally got Nathan into the Church of Scientology. Scientology. <laughs> Welcome, brother. <laughs> wearing a sh yeah, one of the only shirts that still fit me so it's not very interesting because you're preggers because i have a swallowed a basketball because you swallowed a basketball wait i didn't i did i give you that for your tom cruise themed birthday party is that, that why that sounds likely yes i'm gonna say yes because you did give me i have two of these shirts and i almost got rid of them and aaron's like i don't know if you should get rid of that i'm Right. I said I that should. you should at least wear it on one more podcast. And before you get rid of it, you should try selling it on eBay or something like that because people are buying stuff like that. So it's worth it. something. I might just wear it forever. Just see, just wear it around and see if anyone <laughs> responds or has. I'll wear it to all my outings over the next few weeks. <laughs> and if for any reason you end up meeting Tom Cruise, wear it to that meeting. He'll he'll immediately. <laughs> like, I mean, that might be it'd just be a big lie. Yeah, it would probably lead to an awkward conversation. <gasps> You're a uh, lifetime member. I, th no. <laughs> I think member. any I conversation. I think any conversation with Tom Cruise is going to be an awkward conversation. Yeah, no. I don't know. We're just here. Oh, oops! Us. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> oops. In oops. Room, Monster in the laundry room. <laughs> All right, All right, I think we should get into the, um, or at least get into, if anyone has any news for this week. Think Wait, oh on. God, you're saying things too fast. Um, I have news, do you guys have news? Well, just, you have it, so just say it. <laughs> All right, um, it's a story. I went to the supermarket and I walked in and I got a car. It was one of those supermarkets where they only have a huge cart. So I got a cart and I walked in and there's this fucking woman <laughs> near the protein bars and stuff. And she's standing right in front of where I need to look. And she's not getting anything from there. She's doing something somewhere else. So I'm kind of looking and she turns and gives me a dirty look. And I'm like, oh, excuse me. And she just went <clears throat> and ignored me. So I went, okay. I'm coming back because I don't have time to deal with this woman. So I'm doing my groceries. And whenever I look in a certain area, I always park my cart out of the way of people. It's always off to the side, out of the way. So people can get by. Most people don't do that. Anyway, so I'm walking around and I've done that a couple of times. And then, I, and then I'm like, why is my cart so heavy? And I look down and it's full. <laughs> it's bar. full of crap. No, just crap like bad cereals, white bread. You could tell this family has a lot of kids and they don't care about their kids. <laughs> so I'm like, oh shit, I stole someone's cart. So I go back to the last place I had it and it's my cart's not there. And then I go back to the last place I thought I had it. It's not there. And it's like, wait a minute, my cart was pushed up way up. So I accidentally stole the cart that someone put in my place and pushed mine out of the way. That's why I stole their cart. So I was like, whatever. So I leave it there <laughs> and then I go get my car and I'm tooling around. And then I see the original bitch who was a bitch to me and she's looking around and she comes over and she looks in my car. She doesn't have her car. She looks in <laughs> her cart is a cart I stole. 
Wait, so you did have her cart with all the crappy cereal? I had her cart, but I had since put it back and then got my car. <laughs> I'm walking around. And so I'm like, shit, should I tell her? And she's like giving everybody dirty looks with hands on her hips. And she's a bitch. She's a bitch on wheels. You can just tell. And she she walks by me again and looks. And I'm like, should I tell her? Should I tell her? And then I go down and I'm like, all she has to do is walk down. She walks down one aisle, <laughs> doesn't see her cart. She doesn't walk down the aisle that it's on. But she goes another aisle and walks down that aisle. And, she doesn't see her cart. <laughs> and I'm cracking up and people are looking at me. So I'm like, fuck, should I tell her? And then I'm like, nah, and I go one more aisle and then I, and it's the chip aisle. And I'm like, oh, what am I doing here? I don't get chips. She is there. She gives me a dirty look. She grabs these two huge $8 bags of Doritos chips. And I'm like, fuck no, I'm not telling this bitch. I am not going to contribute to her children having diabetes, this fucking bitch. <laughs> So then I go on my way and I'm cracking up. I could barely walk. But then I see her. She found her fucking cart with her huge Doritos and her fucking Fruit Loops and white bread. But anyways, I stole the cart at a store uh, unbeknownst to me. But it was her fault. She fucking pushed my cart out of the way and put her, her cart where my cart was. <laughs> anyway, so I wish that you guys were there to videotape it because it's probably the best thing that's ever happened to me and the funniest thing. And I was laughing the entire time and it was a great day out at the supermarket. Go ahead. I have to say that I would probably be upset like she was if my cart was full and then it was gone. I want to hear her debrief, her like 30 second rant about what happened to her. Yeah. Her point of view. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, listen to me. I, I want to hear about her where she gets off trying to give her kids diabetes. That's what I want to hear. I'm not the one. I am not the one. I'm not going to help her have her kids' feet cut off. Uh-uh. You know, that's not me. Sorry, go ahead. Situations like that are usually good opportunities to lecture people about nutrition. So you don't think you just missed out on that one. I should have. And fucking those big Dorito bags are eight dollars now. I don't know. I don't know what the prices are there. Prices in LA are out of fucking control. Is that party size? Like party they're size? like yeah, they're like the party size, but still, like, wouldn't you expect them to be like three dollars, maybe four dollars, or eight fucking yeah. dollars? I looked and I saw it. And I'm like, what the? How many? Which what store the, was it? Um, it was food for less, which oh, okay. the they should take off the for less because that's expensive. <laughs> Yeah. Oh boy. Anyway, um, the only thing, only news that I have is that on Saturday night uh, we went out. It was a a work party, and then we went met some friends afterwards at a bar, which I haven't done in. I can't even tell you. I don't know. It was maybe pre -pan, pre pandemic, or maybe I've done it since, but um, I've never done it nine months pregnant before. <laughs> we'll just. Say oh my that. god. Um. So, and I, you know, throughout the course of the night, I had some food and had uh, two glasses of water. And by the end of the night, I think we got home by midnight and I just felt like I was absolutely hammered out of my mind. Like I was so like, in, like messed up in pain. And the next day I was like a full on 24 hour hangover just from being out on my feet as a super pregnant lady in a, like a social situation that... Like Nathan lost his voice. I mean, that's how often, like, how <laughs> infrequent we go out and do social things. <laughs> Just from talking. Just from, Just talking, from talking. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, and you had no alcohol whatsoever? No, I can't drink anything. I just want to make, hey, Mary Drader drank in her ninth month. <laughs> um, no, that makes sense. <laughs> So wait a minute. Just think of you guys yourselves four years ago and how you would make fun of the couple you have become now. Yeah, I mean that's why I brought it up because it's a. I definitely we we were trying to figure out which bar to go to. To meet our friends afterwards, which bar had food because we wanted to eat again. Yes, but and not food. <laughs> the one that was closest was right across the street, but it was they had loud music and it was pretty packed. There were some tables open and we walked in. And we we're like, ah, it's loud. Uh, look, let's oh, well, let's see if there's a quiet part. We walked in and the the hostess was like, can I help you? Can I can I get you guys a table? And I was like, we're just trying to decide if it's too loud for us. <laughs> like that's that's where we are. In and life. you know what? It was too. It loud was too loud, so we left. I was like, I just want to have a nice, quiet conversation with my friends. <laughs> I wanna, I wanna 
have that. I want to green light that that movie, that short film of young Aaron and Nathan hanging out with old Aaron and Nathan and see what would happen. <laughs> I think that they wouldn't get along very well. Yeah. <laughs> well I always, I have to say, I've not been, I'm not a loud crowded bar person. That's kind of been yeah. in right. my life. There so. would be a meeting of the minds around food. There would be. We might have yeah. driven somewhere and gotten a little crazier than yeah. we ended up doing. But. See, that's the hook of the film. Like, they don't think they're going to get along. And then, and then young Nathan says, God, <laughs> I could go for some pizza right now. And old Nathan's like, Pizza? I'll fucking kill someone for pizza. And then they go eat. Uh, <laughs> Nathan, anything going on with you? Yeah. So Matthew McConaughey came out with a book a few years ago, uh, an autobiography called Green Lights. And it's a Pretty good book. I read it. I think I listened to the audiobook. And he's, you know, he's a famous actor, Oscar winning actor. So he's. He won an Oscar? He won an Oscar for oh, Dallas, Dallas Buyers Club. Oh, God. I guess uh, anyone yeah. can win an Oscar. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, have you seen the film? It's a really good film. And I haven't. I'm sorry. Pretty excellent. He's actually a really talented actor. So he's, he's good oh, at what okay. he does. Uh, so he wrote this book pretty good book and he's led a really interesting life obviously he's been in the limelight a big celebrity making films so that's really interesting but some of his just life excursions have were really interesting to read about and he kind of wrapped it up in a, a little bit of a kind of a self-help kind of book in a sense of these are the things that I did that helped me through my life these are the kind of the strategies that I put into place and uh some of the the wisdom that I've acquired along the way that helped me along my path. Um, and his metaphor was like, you kind of, you reach, as you're going through life, you hit red lights, you hit yellow lights and you hit green lights. And you gotta know how to react to each of those as you're going down the, the road of life. So it was a pretty good book, pretty successful. And he's been, you know, kind of came out during the pandemic. So he's been online a lot, like a lot of people just kind of staying relevant through that, through social media, as you know, the industry was shut down, but it led to him developing a, a program with uh, like a self-help program that he recently launched uh, online. And it was like a, it was funny because it was just plugged as like a seminar, basically like a seminar, sign up for this free seminar. Of course, it ended up being a five hour long pitch for his program that they're selling. And he's selling it with, oh God, who's the big person? The main Tony guy, Robbins. Tony Robbins. That's the guy. Oh God. So, yeah. So it's, he's, it's like in collaboration with Tony Robbins and whoever sets up a lot of his sorts of seminars. So there's a, a guy that he's collaborating with. I don't know the guy's name, but who basically his business model is finding people who have, something to say that they can sell in these kind of seminars style programs. So it was really interesting because it was taking like really interesting things that he told about in his stories in his book and then packaging it as like a program for people to sign up for and go through and, you know, improve their lives. Right. But what was really funny about it is that uh, John Oliver on his show uh, last week tonight, is that what it's called? This week tonight, something like that, his HBO show, uh, did a little segment on it where they highlighted some of Matthew McConaughey's stories, like moments of stories kind of pieced together. Uh -huh. And some of his stories are pretty wacky. And seeing all the wackiest parts put back, put back to back just makes him sound completely insane. I don't know if you have something to say about that or any anything to add. No, it does. <laughs> yes, David. I, I don't know if I I wasn't going to mention anything, but now that you told now it, that it went where it went, uh, uh, did I tell you that I met Matthew McConaughey that no. before he was famous? A friend of mine did um, God, what's it called? Uh, the movie in Texas where their kids Ben Affleck's in it, and uh, God Parker Posey. God, I can't think of the name oh, of yeah. it right now. Uh, oh God, now I'm blanking. Uh, it's like it's a great it was film. before. Any of them were famous. It was by the guy who did something and something else and yeah, Richard Linklater. It was a yeah. Richard Linklater film. Right. Go ahead. God, I can't think of the name of it. Um, I know. Think of the name. Thinking like the living daylights or like it's, 
It's such yeah. a great film. I love that film. It's like a 1970s drug movie, basically. Yeah. So I met I met all of them actually before any of them were famous, and and he Dazed was actually confused. Dazed and Confused. Dazed and, Dazed and Confused. Yeah, a friend of mine was in that, and uh, he Matthew McConaughey was very nice, very unassuming, very shy, and it was like, oh, this guy's really nice. But the thing I call bullshit on. <laughs> is because there's something about certain people. Like the first time I met him was at this like party and he was very like low key, very like, hello, how are you? Like courteous and shy, didn't really talk to much of anybody. Everybody was still buzzing about him. Like certain people have a buzz about them. I was like, he's nice, I don't get it. But like certain people don't do anything and other people are excited about them. So I don't want to read any fucking book by Matthew McConaughey telling me what to do with my life when he doesn't understand that he has had this privilege and people and all the girls, all the girls at this party was like, oh my God, he's so good looking. He's so good looking. They all wanted to talk to him. So it's like, we need to sit people down and tell them you have not been living in the real world, Matthew McConaughey. No one should follow your advice. No one. I disagree. Uh, it just that. angers me. No, I because the doors that open for him aren't going to open for anyone else. I don't think that's maybe what, for you, but not for me. I don't think that's what he's trying to sell. I think, I think, you but can that's one who has, I think, so think about it as uh, different layers, right? And uh -huh. I'm going to say like Matthew McConaughey is on this layer, like his life exists on this layer. And it doesn't yeah. mean that his life is better than people's whose layers are like down here. Like, the fact that it's up here, just I'm trying to create an analogy. So I'm not putting his above anyone else. We can do it side by side, right? So he's over here and he's in a, because of his looks and whatever genetic gifts he's received, whatever intelligence he has that he had nothing to do with, right? All that stuff that he has doesn't mean someone over here has that if they follow his advice. That just isn't true, right? There's going to be someone right. who's, you know, looks like a truck ran over their face, right? They're just, they're not comparable on, on the looks, right? But right. going through life, he's going he's gonna to have obstacles and he's going to have strategies to overcome those obstacles, which are more universal. That would be my argument against your assessment. Absolutely not. Matthew McConaughey does not understand that doors opened for him because of nothing he did, just because of who he is and he walked into the room. He doesn't understand that. And he thinks, I just did it on hard work and my intellect. And it's like, no. There's something else going on. There is something else going on. I've seen it time and time again. Other people who are more talented doing the same things and people just being like, oh, I'm not interested. And for some reason, yeah. this person is interesting. No, 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 no. Yeah, I think you're overlooking something, though, because there's there are people what? who are more talented than, than him, for sure. And there's a lot of people who are less talented than him. There's a lot of people who have made it in the industry who haven't won an Oscar. You can oh, it's one hundred percent for that or whatever, but so there, but there, are, I think there are certain ways of being that he or choices that you can make while climbing that ladder of success. You know, you could slip off of any rung at any time. You know, there's certain choices sure. or decisions you can make that can send you in 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 the wrong direction, and then when you actually slip and make a mistake, there's ways that you can deal with that that react that the fallout of that that can either push you further away from your goal or reorient you to, back towards your goal so i think that's sure. like where some I, useful insights could come from for him i agree with you but it will only work for another matthew mcconaughey because <laughs> two people two people will do the same exact thing sure. and other people will react in completely different ways well th there's also like i think you're looking at it like not everyone's trying to accomplish the same goals as him so that people could right. be reorienting the wisdom that he's gleaned from his life apply it to their life in their situation and see how it works there and i and I, they I would, will I be sorely read, disappointed i would challenge you to read his book it's really interesting actually he has has had a very interesting life um and and a lot of it's just like well geez yeah of course like I don't know. That's. That was I'm just idea. telling you. I'm just telling you from before he was anybody. He was not anyone. No one knew who he was, and just the way people reacted to him then, even you could tell. Like, oh, 
come on. Like he's had this privileged life that he doesn't even understand yet. And he thinks he had such a hard time. No, no, I, no, I, no, no, no. I don't, I wouldn't put those words in his mouth. I, I'm going to argue the counterpoint, but I don't even know if he, okay. if he believes this. I think he realizes how lucky he is in a, in some, in a lot of ways. Oh, okay, good. All right. right. Then that, at least, I wish that lucky people and, at least acknowledge that people, they're lucky. There are some people, uh, so I was listening to an interview recently. There's some people who walk into a room and they just like embody something, right? And yes. And a lot of people don't hold that. And it's just a, a weird mixture of things. You know, someone... Uh, do you know who Graham Norton is? He runs the. Yes. Okay. Tell us who Graham Norton is. Who's Graham Norton? He's an Irish comedian who has become the most successful talk show host in, in England. And he's hilarious. He's so. Yeah. Dumb. Very funny. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, he was just interviewed on Seth Meyers show. Uh, and he was saying, he's also hosting uh, Eurovision this year. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Like, oh, he hosts season. everything. They ha ask him to host everything now because he's just out of control. But yeah, right. go ahead. I'm a big fan. I've been a big fan of his for 20 years since I went to London and learned about his show. But he uh, he was saying that the only person who really like star strikes him now is Tom Cruise. <laughs> Just thought you'd appreciate that. So some people have a certain movie star quality. Yeah. It just doesn't really, it doesn't, not everyone gets that, you know? 100%. 100%. So, and right. uh, this seems that. like it was a long, drawn-out thing, but this kind of leads into our topic. Anyways, right. go ahead, Aaron. You're the star of the show. Go. Well, we do have a gold star first, if you want to give that. <laughs> seems anticlimactic now. <laughs> <laughs> well, a federal... Here, let me turn this off. A federal judge in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania finally did something good. A federal judge in Pennsylvania ruled that the Satan Club, sponsored by the Satanic Temple, must be permitted to convene at schools. Let me explain this really fast. The Satanic Temple has been trying to put Satan clubs in every schools because there are religious clubs in every schools, and the religious, uh, the Christians have tried to stop it. And the Satanic Temple does not uh, worship Satan. They don't even believe in Satan. They don't believe in God. They're just a religious freedom a uh, group and they use satanic temple because it's the most egregious uh it's the it's the thing that gets people's attention more than any other thing and they've gotten it in a school in pennsylvania they said yeah you obviously if you allow christian clubs you have to allow satanic clubs and it's awesome and the, i read the satanic um 10 commandments and the satanic tenets on this program i don't know if you guys remember it but we all agreed that like, wow, they're so much better than the Christian Ten Commandments. And I'll read them again sometimes if you forgot, because I'm sure you guys are like thinking like, what? You did? Yeah, I remember. We oh, you do? Okay, good. Example. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, so I'm very excited about this. I think they're an awesome group of people. And if you want to find out more about them, check out Lucian Greaves. He's an amazing speaker. Uh, yeah, anyways, that's all. All right. So I don't even think I plugged what we were talking about today earlier in the episode. So everyone who's watching or listening is probably like, what is what is today about? So, you know, we're in our super awesome, neat stuff phase. And today we're going to be talking about super awesome, neat people that we've met, actually met. And then uh, maybe a couple that we'd like to meet as well. That's it. It's pretty simple. I've got a I've got a few. Um, it was interesting because they're all guys. <laughs> You're such a misogynist. No. But um, All right. sorry, these are the first ones. I, like, and I know there's a lot of people that I've met in my life that are super awesome and neat and super awesome, neat people. All those things together, but um, I couldn't remember all of them. So these are the ones that I could remember. <laughs> all right. So since you do it, why don't you go first? Does anyone have more than one? Yeah, I do. Okay. So let's just, we'll just go around. Do you want me to go first? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to kind of start with the uh, least least super awesome neat to most super awesome neat. <laughs> kind of sounds. Uh-oh. But anyway, the first one is uh, my master's program was a uh, bilingual bicultural studies program. And the head of the program was this Cuban guy. Um, and I can't remember his full name. I just know he was Dr. Gomez. 
and he taught some of the classes, but he was, it was a really small program at a small university. So it was very hands-on. You got to know everyone. And he was born in Cuba, fully fluent in Spanish, obviously. Spent a lot of time here, lives here, fully fluent, fluent in English. Um, and his thing, his main drive was to get people to use language the way it's meant to be used, which is something that I'm horrible at. <laughs> My vocabulary is very, very small. And I don't think I was aware of that until I met him because there is a word to express everything, every feeling and every action, everything in the world has a word. Like our dictionary is huge. And we only, most people, including, especially myself, only use like 3% of the words out there. So not only this guy, not only did he know, he just, it was beautiful to hear him speak. Cause he would like, he knew, it's not like he was using words that I've never heard before. I've heard these words, but I just don't think to use them. Hearing him talk in English it was just, it was beautiful. It was like an art. And then the same in Spanish, it was a bilingual program. So it was a lot of translation going on and things like that. Um, and it was just very inspirational. He's talked a lot about grammar. Um, I learned a lot, just a lot about like where commas go. We had a whole entire course on commas and it totally, commas are huge and they change everything if you use them correctly or incorrectly. Um, but that he was just, um, someone that was really accomplished, really smart. It was the first time I ever really thought about language in that way and like looked at it like an art and made, it inspired me to want to do better, even though I do not. <laughs> That's awesome. We have a picture of him, but I'm not sure which. No, I don't have a picture of him. Oh, <laughs> uh, we don't have, a, we don't have a picture of him. I would like to meet him. Is he in LA? I would like, if you, oh, you're not in LA. Well, cause as a writer, words are very important to me. And I realize that since I'm really old and becoming senile, I forget. The other day, I couldn't think of the word excuse and I couldn't even think of how to find it online. And the other day I had to look up how to spell the word able and it like for five minutes, I was just staring at it. But anyways, I understand what you're saying because it, it is very important and it's exciting and yeah. new words can inspire you. Yeah. And there's, we just use these words that are very, very general when, when really there's probably 10 more specific words that could more closely mean the thing we're trying to convey. So when you're talking about effective communication, not even just artful communication, but effective communication, like that's what we should all strive towards. I thought, but like yeah. I said, I just felt like I didn't have enough space in my brain. Like he could do it with two languages. Like I, I couldn't even do it with my own native language, <laughs> let alone a second I language. You must really practice it. I, See, I hated school growing up, but one, a couple of things that I, in retrospect, I'm really thankful for was in seventh and eighth grade, we, oh, maybe it was ninth and 10th grade, it must've been ninth and 10th grade. I had a teacher, an English teacher named Mr. Farang, and he spent the three semesters that I had with him really working on grammar, like, mm -hmm. like sentence structure. And he just ham, like just re repetition and going through all the whole, from beginning to end, different sentence structures. And it stuck with me. I could just, we repeated it enough so that I understood it thoroughly. And then I, I hate taking, I hated taking tests, but vocabulary tests, that was one thing my school did well, I guess, in preparation for SATs. We just did a lot of vocabulary tests. And I remembered a lot of those. I think it's paid off. For you, yeah, you do, I, you do speak very eloquently, more than most people. Thank you. I, I definitely will use words that people will go, oh, why did you use that word? <laughs> <laughs> That's why, you, yeah, we, we watch a lot of we watch a lot of political shows and. I thought yeah. you were going to say porn, but go ahead. No, yeah, oh, yeah, you know, there's not a lot of talking <laughs> in porn, but when the, a lot of political shows, there's really smart analysts and intellectuals on. And, um, I, I often think about language, listening to other people talk, and. Um, I like Nathan kind of falls into that category. Like he could be up there in these interviews. Oh, like, Nathan! Guys. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. It does, and it's re it's really. Skills. I'm not putting myself down. Like I've got my own set of skills, but um, I, my language is limited, and I really wish it wasn't. Because man, there's probably an app for that. There's probably like a <laughs> daily app or Wordle. Is there a Those drug? Like is there a pill? Yeah. Can I just take Dude. a pill? It's amazing. We live in an amazing time. And it is true. There are certain groups you're in where if you say 
if you use the vocabulary you have, sometimes people are like, oh, look at you thinking these words. And it's like, shut up. It's an English word. Anyone can learn it. Or it's a whatever word. And we live in such an amazing time. Yesterday, I had to look up a phrase in Swahili and I found it like that and how to say it. And it, it is really amazing, like Google Translate. Like yeah. we are living in, you know, the, the we're living at the edge of the future. Like we're, we're right on the razor's edge of the future. Like it's really, it is amazing. It was yeah. one thing that actually almost was one of the hooks for me with Scientology when I read Dianetics, David, was the very early on, it talks about vocabulary. And if you don't understand a word to carry around an encyclopedia with your dictionary with you, so that you can look up words and understand things, because it was talking, you probably know more about this than I do, but it's that that's where confusion starts to enter your brain or your, your mind and that you should understand language. It just seemed like a very useful tactic. Yes. <laughs> we'll talk more about that later. I have more to say on that. Yes, what you said, yes, is true. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'll go next. Go. All right. All right. So the person who I met who is super awesome, neat, his name's Sam Harris. You met him? I did. Oh, you him. actually met him? Yeah, I did meet him. And there he's standing in some shrubbery. <laughs> why is he in a bush? <laughs> I don't know. I thought the, funny was, the picture was pretty funny, actually. So that's why I picked that one. It's kind of a beautiful picture, the, the, is, is, the scene behind him. So he's, if, if you don't know who Sam Harris is, he's a neuroscientist, but also an author. He's more famous for his, his books. Uh, the, the first big, large book that he, that made an impact was, called The End of Faith. And he's an atheist, so he's famous for being an atheist. And The End of Faith was a book that he wrote after 9-11 happened. And he saw that there was a, a present threat from religion and that we needed to take it seriously. So his argument was that we need to abandon uh, these fundamental beliefs uh, in, in religion, these you know, the monotheistic traditions that lead to that sort of action. And it's a, it was a very influential book for myself because I was, I grew up Christian, going to a church, was always agnostic, just kind of like I couldn't quite understand why people believe stuff. And at times I wanted to believe, I wanted to be a believer. You know, I thought that would be amazing just to like have that faith. I never really had it. And it took reading some atheist literature, like this book, that kind of made me go, oh, maybe I'm an atheist. And I don't know exactly. I hate labels and that's whatever. But it was a very, it helped me feel okay with how I felt about religion and how I thought about it. Uh, he also has a, he's also a huge meditator. This is what was ironic is that when he came out and made that big splash as an atheist, no one realized that he had spent years uh, becoming a highly proficient meditator. Um, I think he spent upwards of three years all together on silent retreat. So doing like months here, months there, weeks here, weeks there. So it's a really significant amount of time. He's also pretty smart. Um, and he has a, he's famous now for his podcast. Uh, he has a podcast called Making Sense. And he has an app that's pretty popular called Waking, the Waking Up app. Uh, which is about teaching meditation and philosophy and other things about life that could be useful. Um, it was also a book that he wrote called Waking Up. So that was his kind of his spiritual uh, meditation book that he wrote. I met him at a a video, like he was he was videoing a lecture that he was doing when he released the book Waking Up. So I actually purchased his book and got a ticket to see him speak. And part of that was you got to, to meet him. And I'd been a big fan of his for years. I was really excited to meet him. Uh, you know, it was one of those situations where you're just kind of like waiting in line and you get, you know, you get a moment for him to sign your book and say hello and maybe ask a question if you have a question. And it was, it was one of the, probably the few moments where I was starstruck in a way that just seemed really odd because it was, it was like a dimly lit room, you know, kind of moody, like after party kind of feel. And he was just so calm and present that he seemed to like kind of 
glow. <laughs> like he had just this radiance about him that was really calming and unnerving at the same time. Like the dude just seems so like you could ask him any question, he'd be prepared for it. You know, he just seems so centered. Uh, and he was also extremely, he just gave this such a warm vibe. Like uh, he had no insecurity and was making you feel okay. You know, like, you you know, he's really accepting. It was just a really odd moment. And I kind of just stumbled around my words and thanked him. Do you for remember him. what you asked him? I don't think I even asked him anything. I think it was one of those one of those situations where I just felt, uh, what could I ask him that, you know, is would be an interesting question. I don't want to monopolize his time, so I basically just thanked him for his work and said that it had a huge impact on me. That's all I can, I can recall. Yeah. Um, so he's a super awesome, neat person that I met. Sounds like a a, a sand person. That's awesome. Yeah. I highly recommend his, awesome. his work and his podcast and his app. David, who's your San? Okay. I felt like I couldn't Sam? let this go. What? Who's what? Your Sam? Super awesome, neat person. Well, I felt like I couldn't let this go without a quick tribute to somebody who was... Mary Drader. <laughs> who who maybe wasn't the super awesomeness person in the world, but she's one of the most unusual people I met. I was going to say um, Lisa Marie. It's Lisa Marie Presley. And the reason why she was unusual, I really liked her. She was really cool and she had a really wicked sense of humor. And uh, the th interesting thing about her is she kind of sucked the air out of the room not because of her, it's just because every single person reacted to her. Like, uh, like I didn't realize how famous she was because, I mean, she's famous because of her father and she knows it. And she's not one of those people that thinks she's so amazing and cool. So she'd always kind of keep to herself. And when we'd go to like restaurants or something, she'd want to be off to the side. But there's times when she'd have to be in the forefront or like in there. And it was just always a reaction. Like you could feel it. It was really strange. And um, just at that time, I was like, oh, big deal. Like, what's a big deal? But then like finding out more about her life and everything, like there was not a week that went by that she didn't get weird correspondence and death threats and things like that. So she had to have uh, like a group of security guards with her at all times, like wherever she went. And she even came to my house once and I was like, oh, you don't have your security guards with you. And she's like, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, they're here. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, that's interesting. And it's just like to be that person where she had to like for survival insulate herself. Like we can't, the three of us can't imagine that life. Like it just doesn't, she couldn't go to like the supermarket and stuff. And cause, yeah. cause I heard a story when she went once and she didn't realize, they didn't realize there was a story out about her father and he was on like every cover. He was already dead and he was on like every cover of those magazines. And so she's like, I gotta go, I gotta get out of here. And people started recognizing her. And so she had to get out. So it's just like interesting. And I want one other story, like her, her house, she had a really nice house. It was what you'd call a mansion. It was on like a few acres in LA. So it had the rolling grass, which was beautiful. It wasn't the most beautiful or amazing place I've ever, and it was nice. Don't get me wrong. It was really, really nice. But the thing that I, that impressed me that I loved is her pantry. Um, I forget what it was that I wanted or needed or something like that. She's like, yeah, go in the pantry. And I was like, oh, you don't have whatever. And I went in the pantry and it's as big as your kitchen, the pantry. Like it's just a door. You open the door. It's as big as your kitchen. And it was like a mini 7-Eleven. She, I wanted like protein bars or something. And there was like seven different types of protein bars in the boxes. <laughs> like it was everything. It was cookies and, and like everything. And so when I'd go over there, like, can I visit your pantry? And she's like, I don't trade her. And she's like, yeah, go ahead. Like, it was just, it was just like, <sighs> like, you know what I mean? I think you both can feel what I'm feeling right now. If you have that in your house, just every snack you could think of lined up like, you know, from floor to ceiling. Anyways, that's all. Nice. 
Uh, yeah, I kind of feel like any, um, I never longed to be a celebrity for that reason. Not the pantry thing. That sounds pretty cool, but just not being able to <laughs> anything or go anywhere. Well, I've been around, I mean, because you're in LA, I've been around a lot of celebrities. I've not been around a lot of celebrities that have that kind of impact, that are that at that level. Like, there are some people where people are like, oh, do I know who they are? Like, people knew who she was. And like, she would hurt. Anyways, that's all. It was just a different level where it's like, fuck. Like, anyways, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think we should probably try to move through the next round, couple rounds, however many we have, um, a little bit quicker because we're going to run a low on time. We had a should I do my next one really fast? Um, sure. All right. Someone who is at the top of my diva pyramid, like someone who I've loved forever, a singer, Deborah Harry, um, came in. And you guys probably don't even know who she is. Do you? Blondie? Of course. Yeah, she's Blondie. I had a store um, in, in L.A. in the 80s. And I swore she had a book that came out where her boyfriend took a whole bunch of pictures of her and I swiped them and put them on t-shirts and we're selling them at my store. And she came in and I was by myself in the store and the whole display was right there of her shirts. And she went up and she kind of like looked them and I just stood there and I was going to say something like, Oh my God, you're never here. But I just stood there and I was like, she's going to call the cops. Like we're going to get busted right here. She just turned to the person she was with and she's like, Oh, those are Chris's photographs she looked at them she smiled and nodded and walked out and that was it and i was just beside myself anyways <laughs> that's all i was it was simultaneous fear and elation at the same time crazy all right next go <laughs> um okay i'll jump in there. this one um i think i do have a photo of this guy his name's rise Huamani chukapuma <laughs> yeah, that guy. Uh, he's a, a jungle guy sitting there with a big camera. Um, he, <laughs> what? Did you just call him a jungle guy? Yeah, because he's. I'm literally about to tell you that he's from the jungle. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I, okay. All right, <laughs> met, white lady. I just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I met him on a, one of my Nat Geo expeditions. We were in, in the jungle, <laughs> in the rainforest in, of Peru, and he was our guide for the amount of time that we spent there. And um, he was not only, he's like an entrepreneur. So he owns this lodge and runs these tours and, uh, and he knows everything, you know, born and raised in, in this part of the rainforest, like knows everything, he knows what you can eat or what you can touch, like, you know, every, everything, like just encyclopedic knowledge of his surroundings. Um, but one thing I thought was super awesome and neat about him, <laughs> cause we were, we were a bunch of, I don't want to say Americans cause people from all over the world, but like, from, well, but we'll just say Americans, like, so we're all super concerned about diseases. We had to get all these vaccinations to go there and we're all on malaria medication, like having hallucinations because the medication fucks with your head. And um, oh my God. really worried about insects and things like that and like poisonous spiders and you know, everything's down there. Everything's a threat. And so like, we're like all covered head to toe with mosquito gear and whatever. And um, he just walks around on shorts and tank top on like, just doesn't care. And he was basically like, I've had everything. He's like, I've got bit by everything. I've gotten every disease. And he's just, he's like a w walking immune system. Like nothing there bothers him. <laughs> wow. It was like really, I mean, I, I imagine he had a rough, <laughs> rough years being exposed to all these things, but like yellow fever, like you name it. Like he, there was like a, a scroll of like all these <laughs> issues he's had, um, but just being exposed to that for his entire life, he just like can live there and not have any issues or worries. That's awesome. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I want that superpower. Yeah. It's yeah. like he probably just drink the water out of the river. You know, it's just like it, at that point, it's like it could eat or drink anything. And they need to drain his, like take samples of his blood and then make it, turn yes. it make vaccines out of it. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. It's, it's all in this guy. <laughs> right. Come on. Come on. Science. Please. Get to it. I didn't send you a picture, but I have one other. Uh, person I've met that I guess I can throw into this category of super awesome neat. So my aunt is a member of Congress and she was invited onto the Bill Maher show and she invited Aaron and myself and my brother Scott as her guests. So we got to go sit back in the green room with all of the guests for that show, hang out, drink, 
eat food, snacks. Then nice. at the last minute, we were taken out and given seats right, you know, and a nice view for the stage. And then afterwards, we got to go to the like kind of after party that was in the building there, where there was more food and more drinks. And I got to meet Gomar. Yeah, that's it. Gomar. I thought, I thought he. He was someone I thought about putting on this list. Yeah, so but I didn't. He, like, it wasn't a big impactful meeting. <laughs> right. Well, so, okay. Uh, I've been watching Bill Maher since Politically Incorrect, which was on, like, CBS or something back in the 90s. So I, I never really thought of myself as being politically interested, but I loved his show, mainly because he, he would have people with different points of view on it and still does to this day. So you would hear a discussion rather than just you know, a perspective, one perspective. And he's a comedian and funny. And uh, I tend to agree with a lot of his, his, uh, his own points of view. I did talk to him. So when I met him, uh, I did have a, a nice exchange with him because, so it was before, it was before the Biden and Trump election. And he had been sounding the alarm that Trump was going to try to have a coup, like a slow moving coup and maybe a quick moving coup. And as soon as he said that, I was like, you're absolutely right. Like this guy is so, it's so obvious with who he is and everyone kind of laughs at you, but he ended up ultimately being right. So I, I took my opportunity to thank him for sounding that alarm and then tell him that I absolutely agreed with him. And uh, he, you know, I, I, he meets amazing people all the time, famous people, you know, intellectuals, politicians, celebrities, and I'm sure, you know, people are always fawning over him, but he actually, like, when I complimented him there, he kind of took me in and listened and had a, you know, a little uh, exchange with me, which was great. So it was a nice moment for me. That's yeah. awesome. That's cool. I almost and Aaron was too busy eating to have an encounter with <laughs> no, him, No, right? I did. I had a connection to him. My mom went to high school with him. That's right. Yeah. They, and... they went to high school together at the same time? Yeah, but they were three years apart, I think, or four oh, years wow. apart. So that when I told him that, and then it, he was interested for a second. And then when I said what year she graduated, he was like, oh, she was like older than me. She doesn't know me. <laughs> and just moved on. And I was like, damn it. We could have had that. Yeah, he was oh, had a connection. Funny. Yeah, I guess it was the chance where he was like, oh, I know Angie. Yeah, or, I don't that, think they were, they were buds or anything. But Right. Yeah. Oh, David, funny. That's cool. I never knew that. Huh? She, do you have anyone on your super awesome meet list? I do. I'm going to go through my last two people I've met really fast so we can get on to it. Okay. Um, you guys won't know who this is, but I idolize Alice Bag. I love how all of yours are women. <laughs> She's in. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that. Well, no, not, not the next one isn't a woman. But Alice Bag was in a movie. She's a seminal. I guess you'd call it for lack of a better word, but so insulting, punk rock. She's in a movie called uh, Decline of the Western Civilization by Penelope Spheris. And she is incredible. She's been around for a long time in LA. And I just idolized her because she is a woman who started bands in the 70s. And she just, you know, got up and played and she would get booed off stage because even in the early days of punk rock, people don't realize this, but it was a male dominated thing and they would boo women off the stage and she was like, fuck you. And she would do it. And she was just amazing. And I was at a party once and I was talking to this woman who was really nice next to me. We were talking and she was friends with my friends who were there. And it was for this band that I knew. And we were talking, we were like nudging each other and laughing. Da, 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 da. And then finally we realized we didn't even, know each other's names yet and i was like hi i'm david and she goes oh my god you're david monster with the monster store thing and i was like yeah and she's like i'm alice and i was like god you look so familiar have we met before and she's like well i'm in this band right now cambridge apostles which she was in alice bag band and then she's in the and i was like <laughs> like you're alice bag my idol of all idols and she's like shut up and we got in a fight like a fight because she's like shut up you're so stupid she knew who i was and i was like <laughs> and no you guys don't know who, who she is because you guys don't care but it was just amazing like she's amazing like it's just just amazing if you knew her whole story and just her mus musicality and stuff and anyways that was one of 
the most because I was young at the time. That was one of the most incredible, like, <laughs> like where I had to keep it together. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever met anyone where you had to keep it together, but I had to keep it together. Anyways, and then I'm going to do my next one really fast so that one of the coolest people I've ever met in real life, who's one of the nicest people, most mellow and down to earth people, and just makes you feel like you're seen and heard. And it's somebody you guys know. Can you guess who this person is? Aaron Marie Betty Davis Jr. <laughs> I almost thought about her, but she's so selfish and bitchy. You mm -hmm. know, I just want to say, like, Aaron almost made the list, but the other day, Nathan needed his hair styled. But she was screwing around. She was too busy fucking around with things. She's like, I need to take care of my kids and I need to work. And it was rude. Didn't you think so, Nathan? Didn't you think like yeah. she, she wasn't there for you? Yeah, she tries to work and take care of her kids too much. <laughs> it's, it's it's an obsession with her. No, do, any other guesses you want to make? Just the coolest person that just like really like talks to you and wants to know what you what's going on in your life which i had never met a person like this and and i lived with this person for two months and every day was the same never wavered and never i never saw a dark side of this person you lived with them oh i was gonna say matt i was <laughs> gonna say matt but i thought you lived with him for longer it's Matt, maybe three months. It's Matt Hayer. He owns Orcas Island Pottery outside of Seattle. So if you ever get to I Seattle, go to Orcas Island, there. which Aaron went to, and I have not been invited to, so I haven't been to. But he's just one of the coolest people I've ever met, and he really left an impression on me. Of just, and he's really talented and and creative, and just a cool person. He's one of the few people I've met in my life that asks you what's going on with you and wants to know your thoughts and feelings on things. And it's, that's all. He's just a really super cool person. Yeah, I'll back that up. He is unique, one of a kind. Nice, I hate Nathan, him. Nathan <laughs> hates him. I, I feel like I don't know him as well as either of you do. I haven't, I didn't mm -hmm. spend much time with him. He's a total sweetheart and I really enjoyed being around him when I was, but we didn't spend much time together. Yeah. Totally. Um, all right. Through. I, I've got two here. I could blast through them pretty quick. Um, are these people we've met? They are not people. That Finger blast them. Go. Want yeah. to meet. Oh, no. These are people that I've met. Oh. oh. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, so the one is, um, his name's Tommy Heinrich. And this was another, this this guy. Yeah. So I was on another Nat Geo tour down in uh, Patagonia in Argentina. He's from Argentina. Um, and Nat Geo, when you do in these expeditions, they pair you with someone, an expert, depending on what the program is, expert in the area. Um, so they paired us with Tommy. So we spent a good amount of time with our group. And um, he's not only a Nat Geo photographer, which kind of makes my eyes turn into stars, but he's the he was the 600th person in the world to summit Everest. So, which is a really low number considering how many people have done it now. It's like out of control now. Like it's not even really? cool anymore. <laughs> uh, I had no idea. Um, and then he did it two more times after that. <laughs> What, did you ask him why? <laughs> I think it's impressive, but I just want to know why someone wants to do that because there's there's no resort at the top. There's no cake or pizza no. at the top. It's just no. torture. No, and he's just like so nonchalant about it. Like it's not a big deal. You would never know that he did anything like that if you didn't. If I guess it must be the most magnificent, potentially one of the most magnificent magnificent views. In right? theory, if it's clear, if I mean, all you're, the, yeah, yeah. You're, like at the, you're at the top. Yeah, I don't know why he did it multiple times, but anyway, the, the last one I wanted to share was um, I was working, I was videotaping a conference down in, um, it was in LA, and there was the keynote speaker of this conference um, was Aaron Ralston, who was the guy that cut off his arm in ah! uh, 27 hours. Yeah. Have you seen that? I think, who was the guy who was in that? Oh. God. Um, uh, James Franco. Song? James Franco, James thank Franco. you. So the movie the movie was really, really intense. A great movie. It's just like very, very, very hard to watch. Um, this guy, he gets paid now. He has a book. Uh, David just showed his book, um, but he gets I'll paid. Show one to, more time, really fast. Between, between a rock, a rock and, and a hard place. place. Yeah. So I've never read a book. I imagine it's as good as what he, his uh, presentation. It was about an hour of him telling his story live. And I swear, like, no one even moved. You know when you're in a room with hundreds of people, you hear people cough? It was, like, pin drop silent listening to him t tell his story. 
was like way different hearing it from the mouth of a person than like watching someone portray it. He did something that when you just can't comprehend doing that to yourself. You just can't comprehend yeah, having no. to cut off your own. There's like there's nothing about that that makes any sense in my brain. I've the only person I've ever hated more than Aaron Ralston is James Franco. I would rather just die. I would rather die. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. Like, I'm glad that he doesn't make any sense to him either, because I would just go, okay, I'm dying. Who cares? Who cares? Anyways, go ahead. I would care. <laughs> I think I it's care. impressive I, and I his. I to take off my arm to live, but I don't know if I could. I don't know if I could do do it. There's like a certain level of no. drive, willingness to suffer pain. Like that's, oh, it's ridiculous. I feel like I people that might oh. not know the story, he was hiking in, a, I think it was in Utah or Arizona, and he was alone. And he got stuck and a boulder fell on his arm and he was in this cre crevice for many, many days with his arm stuck. And the only reason he survived and got out was because he cut off his own arm. Not only did he cut off his own arm, he had to break the bone. Stop it. Oh, stop. Yeah, he had to do all of it. Ugh, uh, wait, okay, go ahead. A pocket go knife ahead. to cut through his flesh. And the worst part was when he had to cut the nerves. Oh, because it sends you remember pain, that from the movie, yeah. yeah, all the way up your body. It's like, and then he had to hike out. <laughs> and then he had to hike out. <laughs> he had to yeah, hike his way out. yeah. It wasn't even over then. No. And then he hiked. Okay, out. are you guys done? I took out my <laughs> earplugs, so I couldn't hear anything you said. I hate that. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Yeah. All right. Um, just just being in the presence of that. <sighs> He's just so he was so like such an amazing storyteller for one, a really incredible person, and this his just energy for life and. It was I don't, just a, like a very infectious, positive energy. How did, you don't. How did no he keep from people. bleeding to death? Is what I want to know. Put a tourniquet on his arm. So he, he, how? He, he's a climber. <laughs> so he, what's interesting is he was like he slipped down this crevice as this boulder came down, and it like somehow pinned his arm between the boulder uh. and the, the crevice or something. And he was like stuck there. So he's like he had to like he had to like create a swing for himself to sit in. <laughs> drinking his own pee drink drink his own pee and it was only i think it was only after he realized that like there was no way he was going to save his like the arm was gone like it was and it was going to infect like there's going to be infection because his arm like it was dying good i would welcome death i would just welcome it i don't care oh god yeah it's well he's got wild. a pretty amazing life and career now he's married and that seems really yeah. happy but it, if you guys life. Yeah. He's a hooker. What? He's a hook for a hand. <laughs> I think we're gonna go around and then um, say one person that we would like to meet. Correct? Is that how we're gonna end one? Up? Okay. We have to wrap this up. This yeah. we're going so long right now. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh go God, sorry. Okay. All right. So, can I just say? Wait, you've got to explain this because I don't understand it. But go ahead. Go. Go. Sure. Well, that's the, thing <laughs> that's the point. Why I want to meet Jordan Peterson. Jordan yeah. Peterson. Look oh, at that look at suit. His suit. Yeah. So it's he half half. he had someone designed this suit for him, made the suit for him, and it's his heaven and hell suit. So Jordan Peterson, if you do not know who he is, he's a psychologist. He was a professor. He's an author. He it, <clears throat> he is a very controversial figure. He's an online celebrity. He uh, yeah has raised a lot of controversy online so why what was your question david why why him well when i found out that you were into him i took a deep dive and i listened to a lot of, of stuff he said and watched his videos and he's an uncompassionate <laughs> creep so w explain why you admire him because he's a dick and uh, he's and he's lied about a lot of things like i anyways go ahead yeah what is he lied about I don't remember. I saw a video when they show him saying it and then they would show the facts and stuff. And I took a look at it and some of the things are not true. And even even he does yeah. that thing because he's Christian. So he'll do that thing like talking about Bible verses and stuff and what they mean. And it's like, nope, no, that does not mean that. But go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's interesting because he's I think he's becoming more Christian, but I wouldn't say that he's Christian. I don't think he would define himself that way. Um so he, this is a perfect example. He's a very controversial figure. Why I 
am interested in Jordan Peterson. One, he's a psychologist, so I'm really interested in psychology and how I'm interested in people and how we think and how we elevate ourselves and get in our own ways and all the reasons for that. And he's very smart. So he's been, he was a professor for decades. He taught at Harvard. He taught at the University of Toronto. He's very decorated as a professor uh, and was non-controversial until he became controversial, which was later in his career and then became famous. Um, so he has a lot of knowledge. He's also very smart. Like he's very articulate, talking about articulate, being articulate and having uh, a, a mastery of the of language. He, he can just, he has like a razor sharp brain that can just cut through arguments and find the nuance. So I, I, I think the trap that he has fallen into is because the topics that he spoke out on initially were pretty controversial. He was politicized from the get go. And then from the left specifically, there were hit piece after hit piece after hit piece put out towards him to try and take him down. And most of those, if not all of them were lies or, uh, trying to paint him in the most negative light possible, like taking good faith arguments that he has and trying to look at them through a perspective that was skewed to make him look like a hateful, terrible person. Uh, I, I don't want to defend him entirely. I mean, he's, he's a person, he's flawed. And he's one, one, <clears throat> one thing that's great about him is he recognizes that and talks about that, how he's not perfect. And he's, you know, kind of walked the line in public trying to push his perspectives, but also overstepping at different times. And, you know, there's a, no need to get into details there. But uh, so my desire to meet him is someone who's very smart, who is very well read and has like a, a deep knowledge in a lot of categories that I'm interested in and who I agree with in a lot of ways, but then there are places where he pushes in certain directions where the reason I'd want to meet him is to just like dive into the questions that I have where I see that we split ways in our, in our, uh, in our points of view, our view of life or our opinion about certain topics. Um, I don't think you're ever going to find anyone who is going to match all your topics and that's where it can get, or, or your points of view on topics. And that is where it can get interesting is where you can kind of, push off each other in those those conversations. So he's someone I would like to meet and do that with. Okay. All right. So okay. you, yeah, you yeah. Turn your hatch off. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Like slight deviation from baby stuff. She's hatch. finally falling asleep and she can't fall asleep at this hour. <laughs> Stressing uh -oh. me out. Child's just been awake for the last two and a half hours not napping. Oh, and now no. she can't fall asleep and it's like bedtime already. <laughs> Oh my God. How funny. All right. Who do you want to meet? Cause I have a bunch I'm, of people. I'm not, I have like very little explanation. It's Jim Carrey. I just think he's a fascinating human and I'd be very curious to see what he's like in real life. He has had a, a, a arch lately. Like he's had a up and down and crazy and out of control. Like, and he's come like 360 on certain things. And can I say before you go ahead, why do you want to meet him? <laughs> I, said, I just think he's fascinating and he sometimes surprises me with really very smart remarks that he's done graduation addresses that were so phenomenal and inspirational and then, and then he can seem so crazy and kooky and out of his mind like, i don't want to just know who he is <clears throat> I, I i will say that um when kathy griffin went through her donald trump thing and a bunch of Democrats and people who hate Donald Trump turned on her and refused to still talk to her like Anderson Cooper and mm -hmm. Cher. She said that Jim Carrey called her up. She'd never met him. She didn't know. She didn't know him at all. Called her up and he said, I'm sorry for what you're going through. What you did is not illegal. And I think it's free speech. And I think it's really cool. If you need me, I'm here. He said, go for it, bitch. Like, keep going and doing. And he goes, I don't necessarily agree with what you did, but I agree with your right to, to do it. 
And I thought that that was really cool. And she said that it was really touching. And she just said she she thought it was the coolest thing she'd ever heard. She just broke down on the phone and couldn't stop crying. And he was like talking to her and just telling her a whole bunch of great stuff. And I was like, wow, that is really cool, especially because he didn't know her. He didn't have to know her. Yeah. Go ahead. Have to do that. Yeah, that's that's very cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. So that's good. So we like Jim Carrey better than we like Jordan Peterson right now. So strong we, David. Sounds like you. <laughs> <laughs> all right my people i have there's so many people i want to meet but it's funny because i thought about this and then there's so many people i don't want to meet that i love just because i know that they would not like me <laughs> anyway uh i'm back again there's people that i idolize that hey okay, there's there's three people i idolize a lot and there's i had to cut it way down uh, French and Saunders are two of my favorite people in the world. They're my comedy heroes. It's uh, Don French and Jennifer Saunders. And they're British um, comedians. They're a British comedian pair. And they're they're responsible for, like, absolutely fabulous. And I don't know if you guys know The Vicar of Dibley, but it's a huge show in England. Um <laughs> And they're just, they're amazing. They they do French and Saunders a show that only had six seasons, but it's some of my favorite comedy in the world. And I think you guys would like it too, because it's not, it's, it's like, it's kind of like a precursor to like Tim and Eric or like any of that kind of stuff where it's like, it's just normal stuff. They just, my favorite comedy in the world is, understanding the absurdity of the human condition like that the funniest comedy is just people because people are re fucking ridiculous and it's just these two women who have been fortunate enough to meet each other and find the same comedy and they point out all, all they do is point out how you know the the mundane how ridiculous it is and it's just really the thing about watching their show, Friends and Saunders, is so amazing, is these two women who actually love each other. You can tell that they love each other. And I watch videos of them, of interviews, and they talk about how much they love each other. And it's just been just this, you know, they've been working for 40 years, and it's just been this love affair of, of comedy. And then the next person is Kathy Burke, who um, actually worked with them. They would bring her in sometimes when they needed a third woman to be a comedian and <laughs> she, <laughs> she has done, you've seen her in things because she's also a serious actress and she's been in films where she's, she's an amazing dramatic actress, but she's one of the funniest people in the world. And unfortunately she has stopped acting. God only knows why, cause she's so amazing, but she's doing a lot of directing of theater and stuff. And you guys, she just is British and she's done a lot of British things and you fucking Americans don't even appreciate her because you're just so awful because you think Friends and Seinfeld is the height of comedy. But anyway, <laughs> well, let me, I'm just going to throw in one more. I know I'm not supposed to, but it's also akin to Amy Sedaris, who is another one of my comedy idols, who is just hysterical. And it's just, it's, I want to get together. I'd like to have a party with all four of them because I think they'd really like each other and that would be amazing and just comedy. And I think comedy is going to heal the world. Baba Booey, go. I don't still know. I mean, I know Amy Sedaris and she's funny, but I don't know the other ones you were talking about. So I'll take your word for it. Kind of take the British version of Amy Sedaris, but not like her in any way. Cool. <laughs> well, hopefully we can make our dreams come true one day. Maybe we can have I know, party. right? All right, we went way over time, so thank you for tuning in, and we'll so be sorry. back. Um, I think we'll be getting a guest on in the next episode or two, so stick with us. We might have a very controversial guest on our next one, yeah. Hmm. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Now beat it, bitch. <laughs>